He was educated by Benedictines, but then joined the English province of the Dominican order. <laughs> In 1965, he was ordained a priest in 1971. Timothy studied with, at Blackfriars and at St. John's College in Oxford and in Paris. He was chaplain at the University of London, 1975 to 76, before returning to Oxford where he taught scripture and doctrine. Besides teaching, Timothy is involved with the peace movement and ministry to people with AIDS. He was elected provincial of the English province in 1988. At that time, he was also named president of the Conference of Major Superiors. In 1992, was elected master of the order and has finished his term in 2001. Since then, Timothy has been a bit of a traveling road show. <laughs> in the text I received, it said itinerant preacher and lecturer. The traveling, touring, road show would be my translation. He spends half the year on the road and the other half back at Oxford. His own religious brother in Montreal, Daniel Cadrin, says when you hear Timothy, you hear all the people he has listened to over the years and throughout his travels. According to Daniel, we're about to meet a man of, of passion, a man with a passion for the word of God, from studying it and preaching it and living it daily. A friend of his in Montreal tells me that Timothy was surprised to be elected Master General. He really didn't meet all of the qualifications as far as his past experience. That might be rumored, but he does sing a new song, and according to Daniel, maybe even dance a new dance. <laughs> Welcome with me this morning, please, Timothy Radcliffe. Thank you very much. I always hate listening to these introductions. They make you feel such a fraud. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to be, to be with you in so much as I am. I arrived uh, late last night on an airplane from, from England, from London, not Ontario. And uh, so I'm a bit jet lagged. Uh, I woke at four this morning full of enthusiasm and ready to lecture, but I came down and there was nobody here. <laughs> and now I feel it's just about ready to go, it's time to go to bed again. So if you feel I'm a little incoherent and a bit lost, it's I haven't been getting at the duty free. I've, I've never been a, a vocation director. In fact, I've only once in my life ever succeeded, as far as I know, in encouraging anybody to join the order. Once in the United States, uh, during visitation, I met a young man, a young Dominican friar, and I said, how did you come to be a Dominican? And he said, well, one of the brethren invited me to join. And I said, great, well done him. I said, who was it? And he said, it was you. <laughs> I, I thought this was a bit odd since we'd never ever met before. And then it all came back to me. What had happened was a few years earlier, a cousin of mine had come up to Oxford with an American friend of hers. And we'd gone out and gone to a pub and had lunch together. And I said, well, what about your children? And he said, well, one of them's about to join the Jesuits. I was, as you can imagine, a little bit shocked. <laughs> so there and then, in the pub, I sent him a postcard. And I said, don't join the Jesuits, join the Dominicans, I said. And he did. So if there are any of my Jesuit brothers around, I'd just like to say you lost a very fine biblical solar. Eat your heart out. <laughs> this has been my only attempt at vocation promotion. I didn't want to spoil my 100% record. And so I really have to confess that I've got no great expertise 
or experience, at least I have to show my solidarity with you, my support for your very important ministry. I know that it can be deeply stressful. I believe, I was told the other day, that a higher percentage of people who are involved in, in the promotion of, uh, of vocations leave religious life than any other group. I think very often your brothers and sisters either believe that your work is unnecessary and a waste of time, or else they often have unrealistic expectations of what you can achieve. You're expected to produce results. How often do people say, how many are you bringing in next year? <laughs> we had a, a brother in the United States who was a vocations promoter who was called the tugboat because of the number of people that he managed to bring in each year. So it's a stressful way of life. Though I must admit you, you look on the whole <laughs> rather cheerful and undepressed. I gather it's a way of life that's got compensations. One of my sisters told me last night, she said, you know, I'm not used to staying in hotels like this, she said. She said, uh, I've only been in vocational promotion for a few months. <laughs> I noticed she sometimes seemed to confuse the word vocation with vacation. <laughs> I won't tell you her name because I don't want to embarrass you, embarrass her, but it, it happens to be the English word for truck. <laughs> Stop blushing, Laurie. <laughs> In these uh, two lectures, I, I want to take a, a look at what it might mean to have a religious vocation and what are the challenges that you face in presenting that vocation to people today. And at the end, you'll be able to say, well, it's evident he's never been a vocations director. But I console myself, as I do so often when I lecture, by remembering one of my American brethren who gave a lecture. And when he sat down at the end, the applause was tepid. <laughs> and he turned to the man beside him and he said, it wasn't that bad, was it? And the man said, oh, don't you worry. He said, I don't blame you. I just blame the people who asked you to speak in the first place. <laughs> I'd like to, to start by, by reading a short biblical text, uh, I suppose the, the obvious one from Luke's Gospel. In, I'm afraid, the authorized version, which is the only one I could find at the last minute. Thanks be to God for the Gideon Society. <laughs> and it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesaret, and two ships standing by the lake, and the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answered, saying to him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish and their net almost broke. And they beckoned to their partners, which were in the other ships, that they come and help them. And they came and filled both ships so that they began to sink. And Jesus and Simon Peter saw it. He fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. But he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of fishes. And so also is James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Simon. 
And Jesus said to Simon, fear not. From now onwards, you shall catch people alive. And when they had brought their ships to the land, they forsook all and followed him. So Jesus saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen were out of them, washing their nets. Peter was a fisher. It wasn't just something that he did a few hours every day. It wasn't just a job. It was a skill. It was a craft. He probably came from a family of fishers. His cousins were fishing in the other boats. He probably grew up, like many poor people in rural parts of the world today, thinking that this would be his whole life, his only future. So he had to learn how to make nets and how to prepare them. He had to learn how to read the weather. He had to learn how to sail his boat, where to find the fish. It shaped his whole life. It was a life. You could call it a calling, a vocation. Now today there are very few fisher men and women in this sense. There are giant factory boats and they scoop up hundreds of thousands of tons of fish indiscriminately. They process them and they freeze them. The satellites tell the captains where to find the fish. Now they need skills, of course, these people. They need technological skills, factory skills. They don't need the skills of fishers. This is a job. It's not a vocation. Usually, most of the crews on modern fishing boats are poor immigrants from the Philippines, Thailand, Eastern Europe. They've got no rights. They're often treated with cruelty, and they're separated from their families. They aren't fishermen and fisherwomen. They're just people who happen to fish. And most of them would do something else if they could get a job and papers. Now, this is one reason why we have a crisis of religious vocations today. How can you understand a religious vocation if you cannot understand an ordinary vocation? what it is to have a life, a calling, which shapes all that you do and are. Since the, since the beginning of history, but especially since the Industrial Revolution, your jobs, the whole idea of a job, I suppose, is a relatively recent one, shaped all that you did from your late youth to retirement. Being a fisher or a plumber or a business executive or a train driver was part of who you were. It gave you a place in society. It gave you your contribution to the future of humanity. It was your part of building a better world. It was even more the case if you had what we used to call a vocational job, being a nurse or a doctor or a teacher, or an academic. This was a calling, regardless of whether you believed in God or not. And in England, though I suspect less so in the United States of America, this was a great reason for not paying these people very much money, because they were following vocation, like religious. So the whole idea of having a religious vocation reposed on the foundations of your life's work as a calling. So I think that that's part of the root of the crisis of vocations that we have. In fact, I'd say it's got two roots. One I'm going to look at this afternoon, if anybody still turns up, and the other this morning. One, which I shall look at this afternoon, is that having a vocation was not just about what you did, 
It was about how you belonged to a community of people. To be a fisherman or fisherwoman was to belong to the community that fished. To be a nurse was to belong to the nursing profession. But this sense of belonging has been profoundly weakened in our society. We individualistic Westerners are highly suspicious of any idea of belonging to any institution, whether it's the church or religious order or the government or anything. So to say, I am called to give my life to an institution, the Franciscans, Salesians, or whoever, sounds profoundly menacing and frightening. So this afternoon, what I want to look at is how can belonging be good news? How can it be a liberation to learn to say, not just I, but we? But this morning, in, in this first lecture, I want to look at another root of this crisis, which is how we may make sense of our lives as a whole with a long story, the long narrative that reaches until death. Until very recently, one's job was a central part of giving a sense to the whole of your life, the whole story that you could tell about who you were. You might begin life as a junior nurse, but wouldn't you look forward to the time when you might become that most terrifying of all human beings, the matron? <laughs> you might begin life as a, a junior lecturer, but you could dream that one day you might be the president of the university and fire all your enemies. <laughs> you might be a sergeant, but you could dream of being a general. And that sense of a whole life, a whole life story, a narrative that encompassed everything was fundamental in sustaining the idea of a religious vocation. We've largely lost that. And I think there are two reasons. First of all, because most jobs are no longer for life, the average American has 11 jobs in a working life. Companies don't depend upon a stable workforce. The Industrial Revolution was built upon the marriage of capital and labor. Modern capitalism is built upon the marriage of capital and the consumers. The labor force is easily replaced. I met a man the other day after I gave a, a lecture at the National Conference of Priest Councils. And he told me that during his life, he'd started life as a, as a gardener, and then he'd been a mortician, and then he'd been an, an advertising executive, and now he's working for the National Conference of Priests. I didn't ask him whether that was more like advertising, being a gardener, or being a mortician. <laughs> People are disposable, where spare parts that can be fitted in and out of any job, like the parts of a car or a washing machine. We live in a society of weak and temporary ties, whether it's in the workplace or in marriage. And so as Nicholas Boyle, an English from, uh, professor from Cambridge, Cambridge, England as well, said, we can still just about say he is a printer or she is a teacher. But increasingly, this is not what they are, but what they just happen to be doing at the moment. So in this sort of society, it's hard to imagine what it might mean to say, I am a Dominican. I am a priest. I am a religious. The temptation is to think, that's what I happen to do today but I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. But this loss of a sense of having a whole life rooted in a long narrative is part of a deeper crisis. 
We've lost the sense that humanity has a shared future, that there is a story to be told about humanity. We've lost our dreams of a better future for humanity. The utopias are gone. Oliver Bennett, who wrote a very interesting book, whose name escapes me at the moment, he said that at this moment in the West, we're suffering what you might call a collective depression. We seem to be destined to disaster. We can see the growth of violence in the inner cities, the spread of AIDS, increasing poverty and inequality, clashes between religions, a war on terrorism, and the biggest threat of all, ecological disaster. Please persuade your government to sign the Kyoto Protocol. <laughs> so let me get, let me get, give me a chance to get this on so I can walk around a bit more. Does this work? I think I think we'll have to I'll have to get properly linked up. I, I think that until the late eighties, most people did still live with a sense that there was a longer story. I think till up to about nineteen eighty nine and the fall of the Berlin Wall. And then as Fukuyama famously said, history is over. When I was a child, you did have a sense that humanity was on the way. Cars and planes got faster every year. The computers got bigger and bigger until they started getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> Even the food in English restaurants began to get better. <laughs> you could eat frog's legs and snails. And when my father wasn't looking, my mother used to put garlic in the, in the cooking. <laughs> the kingdom of God must be nigh. <laughs> but that was, the, that was the last echo of the confidence of our ancestors. As Charles Dickens, the, the great Victorian, wrote, time is rolling for an end, and the world is in all essentials getting better, gentler, more forbearing, and more hopeful as it rose. This is what we lost really in the last 80s. We lost hope. That doesn't mean to say that everybody became miserable. Hope is not about being cheerful. It's about being sustained by that promise of the future. Though in fact, all over the world, as you probably know, there is an epidemic of suicides of young people from Ireland to Japan. I think we could say that, that now there are really two narratives of the future which we share with our young people. One is the scientific narrative, which goes from the Big Bang to the Big Chill, when the world will grow cold. In this story, we human beings have no significant part to play except for maybe to make the odd ecological disaster, is not a story that gives hope. The second story by which we are learning to live now is even worse. It is the war on terrorism, a strange sort of war. It's hard to know what would ever count as winning it. All it seems to promise is more and more violence. And so, in this society, the temptation is to live just for now, the now generation, to eat, to drink, and to be merry. It's hard to get your head around the idea of a vocation which is until death, usque ad mortem. In my impression, coming back to England after 10 years' absence, is that society is filled with amazingly generous idealistic young people. And yet, they have not got that sense 
that the whole of their lives might be called to have a sense. So I'd say that religious life has been dealt a double whammy, if you have that expression in the United States. Many religious lived their vocations by practicing a secular vocation. They were religious who were doctors, nurses, teachers, academics. But if there is no secular vocation, that undermines, it subverts, if you want, the foundation upon which many religious built their religious vocation. So I think it's all connected with that exodus which you find of religious from secular vocations into pastoral ministry, parochial ministry. But if you've got no sense of a secular vocation, it's very hard to grasp the idea of a religious vocation. It's like trying to understand the Eucharist if you've never seen bread. What could be the bread of life if you've never seen bread? What could be a religious vocation if you've lost the idea of an ordinary vocation? But even more, if we've lost our dreams for the future, our utopias, if they've crumbled, what might it mean to give your whole life to the Lord? Usque ad mortem. Until death. Now this is why your role as vocation directors is both so hard, but also so exciting and so important. Because what's at issue in your work is that I don't think primarily about recruitment so that we can keep our corrugations and orders ticking over. What's at issue is how do we embody hope? How do we, as religious, be signs of the God's promise and summonings to an unknown future? And that's a fantastic challenge. If you don't actually get a great deal of vocations, maybe it doesn't matter so much because you're actually involved in something vastly more important than that. In a society tempted to despair, then our crazy lives, even if there are just a few of them, embody hope for humanity. It says you can find a way of being alive as a human being which gives sense to the whole of your life and beyond. I'm thoroughly convinced that religious life is only of any interest at all, of any importance, if it speaks about what it means to be a human being. Other vocations, such as marriage, do this as well in other ways. They're not our concern this morning. Our vocation is to express what it is to live as a human being with hope. Now, we seem to have forgotten Peter and his cousins washing their nets. So let's get back to them and see what's going on with them. Jesus saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had got out of them and were washing their nets. So these fishermen had already stopped fishing. They were washing their nets because the fishing was over. Peter thinks it's over just for today. Tomorrow will be another day out on the lake, and so on, until the end of his life. In fact, except for one last glorious catch, it's over forever. And when Peter does bring in that big catch, it almost sinks the boat. It almost does in his livelihood. So that's the message from the beginning. Peter, it's finished. And Jesus says to them something which is very beautiful. It's best translated as, from now onwards, you will be catching people alive. That's an incredible statement for the now generation. From now onwards. There's no end to it. He doesn't say for a week or, you know, just give me three years. And so Jesus invites Peter to embark on a journey into the future. However, Peter does not seem to be at all enthusiastic. Instead of standing up and walking, he falls on his knees. He tries to become stationary, stuck 
I, I think that this beautiful little story, and I must keep an eye on the time and not let myself get carried away by it, this beautiful little story hangs on how you hear the Word of God. You see, it's all about hearing the Word of God. People, Peter takes his boat out into the sea so that it may be a sort of floating pulpit so the people may hear the Word of God. He goes out fishing again at Jesus' word, it says. That's all fine. Here he, he serves the word in what he knows how to do. He serves the word as a fisherman. But then the word asks him to die to being a fisherman, to leave it behind. You see, the word which we serve does not primarily give us any information about God. It is the call to be. It's the word which summons us into existence at the beginning. The vocation, the vocation that every one of us has is the vocation to exist. So just as God at the beginning said, let there be light, and there was light. So he said, let there be Timothy, and there was Timothy. But unfortunately, he just doesn't leave it there. He goes on calling and calling. God calls through our mother and our father. God calls through the people that we love, through our first boyfriends and girlfriends. God calls through the scriptures. He goes on calling. And every call is a sort of dying. It's part of being summoned into existence. A religious vocation is simply the most dramatic, the most explicit moment in which we hear the voice which says, come and exist, flourish. Now that always implies if you want continuity and break. Peter goes on being a fisher. It's just that he stops catching dead fish and starts to catch people alive. It's just like with Francis of Assisi, isn't it? He used to be a troubadour, which sung of the love of women, chivalrous love. And then God said, come and sing a different sort of love. Be a different sort of troubadour. A troubadour for me. Just as St. Ignatius, to shine broad-minded, used to be a soldier. And Christ said, come and be my soldier. Come and be Christ's soldier. Or I think of one of my brethren who's trained as a lawyer. Now he's Christ's lawyer. He fights against slavery in Brazil at the daily risk of his life. Or I think of another of my brethren who used to teach ballet at Washington University. Now he dances for the Lord. I remember at our general chapter three years ago, when that lovely moment when they elected my successor, he danced. <laughs> Perhaps it was for joy that I was finishing, but <laughs> most of the brethren were bowled over. Some were rather alarmed. Peter resists. He doesn't want to die. He wants to just carry on fishing for fish. He resists transformation. And that sort of dying is what is always required for our flourishing. We are reluctant to let go of who we have been. I remember when I, when I joined the order in 1965, I find it incredible to think that's almost 40 years ago, but I, I found myself with a whole lot of novices who, who were very different from anybody I'd ever known before. We came from very different backgrounds. There was nobody in my novitiate of 12 who came from my sort of background. And 
To be honest, I, I'd longed to join this community of the Friars, but when I did, I felt lost. Who was I with these people? They knew nothing of my way of life. And we, in England, we live in a much more you know, class divided society than you do in the United States. I doubt whether it would be such a shock. And I remember how, how delighted and pained I was. I had to die to who I had been to up to then. My elder brothers used to give me their second-hand clothes, and I loved it. It was partly because that obviously saved spending any money, but also they were clothes that reminded me of who I had been. I had to let go of the past. Peter says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. One of my brethren in the English province, Richard Finn, said, to be forgiven, to become a disciple, is necessary to abandon those sins that have been part of our lives. Think, for example, of what it takes in terms of personal and social identity to abandon sectarianism, homophobia, nationalism. But Jesus says, I'm still quoting Richard, Jesus says to Simon, do not be afraid. What we have fear is disintegration. Our loss of who we are is not our undoing, but our making. So becoming a member of a congregation or an order is a sort of dying. You die to a particular identity as, as a consumer, somebody with the power of money. Maybe an ethnic identity ceases to be so central. A sexual identity will define you differently. And when people see us doing this, trying our vocations, our friends are often astonished. They don't know what to say. It can seem inhuman. How can a nice young person like you give up marriage, a career, children, wealth, freedom, and become a nun or a brother? But I believe that every religious vocation is just the explicit sign of the human vocation, which is the God who calls us from the moment we are born and conceived to go we know not where, and who goes on polishing us, honing us, chipping away at us until we are as we are intended to be in Christ. When Michael Moore received the Palme d'Or at uh, Cannes this year for his film Fahrenheit 9-11, he said a Jesuit education had taught him always to ask, how might I become a better person? Somehow, these religious had communicated to him a sense that to be a human being was to be on a pilgrimage. It was to go on becoming better, leaving behind what you had be, living by hope, responding to an invitation. So then how might we as religious be signs of that pilgrimage? The last time I, I tried to answer that question was for the Conference of Major Superiors of Men in the United States in 1996. And I did it in terms of religious life as leaving behind the usual signs of identity. Our vows liberate us from the usual ways in which people claim identity in this society and so point to the kingdom. Actually, I thought, well, I can't repeat that lecture. It's been published. You may have read it already. And you want your money back. <laughs> so I have to give a different lecture. I must admit, having tried to give a different lecture, I think the first one was better. So what I'm going to do is use a slightly different approach this time. I suggest that our lives as religious point to the kingdom because we live a story whose end we can't articulate. To be a religious is to promise to let God go on surprising you. 
It's not to know what's next in the plot. Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people alive. Our society is suffering from a crisis of hope because I said we've lost that sense of the future. Who could have a facile sense of confidence in the future of humanity after Auschwitz? The last century was crucified by people who thought they knew the road map. They thought they knew where humanity was going. Tens of millions of people died in the Soviet gulags because communism said, we know the story. We know what happens next. Six million Jews and millions of other people died in the concentration camps because some people thought they knew where humanity was going. A few months ago, I was in Cambodia and I went to the Toral Sleng Genocide Center in Phnom Penh. I went with a bishop who'd lived through that period. He said everybody who had soft hands, wore glasses, or spoke a foreign language died. A third of all Cambodians died. Every single Cambodian priest was killed. It's terrible. You go in and you, you see all their pictures. They didn't have time to destroy all the archives. So you see the photographs of every person who was admitted to this particular genocide center. Only one person survived. And he couldn't speak about it. He could paint it. So the last century was crucified by those who knew the road map. If you knew the story, then the tendency was to build the killing fields. I suspect that's the danger with the war on terrorism. We think we know what the plot is. And we may well kill millions of people in our attempt to live it out. We Christians, we have a hope for the kingdom, but we've no idea how we're going to get there. We can't open the book of Revelation and say, hey guys, five plagues down, two to go. <laughs> Our hope is for the kingdom, but we've no more idea than anybody else how we are going to arrive. Our foundational story, the story that we can tell, is of the Last Supper. And that is the story of the loss of story. As they went up to Jerusalem, the disciples were buoyed up with excitement. They knew what was going to happen. The kingdom would come. Maybe the Romans would be booted out. Jesus would tear off his flimsy garments and be revealed as a warrior. We're not quite sure what story they told, but they had one. As it said in the journey to Emmaus, we had hoped that he was the one who was to redeem Israel. Every time we celebrate the Eucharist, we remember the time the story was lost. Because on that night, there was no longer any story to tell. Because Judas had betrayed Jesus Peter was about to deny him, and most of the rest would run away. Faced with his death, there is no story. There is only promise. So that's the paradox. This is our story. Every, we just, just a few minutes ago, we celebrated the Eucharist. We remember that night. That's our foundational story. But what it tells is at the moment when every story about the future is demolished. Now you might say that the vocation of every Christian is to go forward bravely from now onwards without the foggiest idea how he or she is going to get there. Peter was called from this nice predictable life, fishing fish, doing what he knew how to do, 
but he had no idea where it would take him. Not because Jesus didn't want to tell him, but because where he is going is beyond imagination. As St. Paul said, for what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor has the human heart conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Our hope is for what is beyond words. So our bizarre way of life as religious, I'm arguing, I can't put this very well, I'm stuck to this, this microphone here, bent over, our odd, bizarre way of life points to how we live for what we cannot say. As the medievals used to say, we are capax day. We are capable of God, what cannot be imagined. Think of obedience. In the next lecture this afternoon, if anybody turns up, I should look at what obedience means in terms of belonging, learning to say we. But it also is about daring not to know what's going to be asked of you. There's an old saying, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> One might also say, tell your brothers and your sisters. Obedience is not a servile and blind submission of the will. It is the vow never to stop being surprised. One of my closest friends in the order is called Jean-Jacques Perenez. He is a member of the French province, economist, went to Algeria, studied irrigation, uh, he taught uh, irrigation in the university at Oran in Algeria. It was a tough, dangerous life, but he was profoundly content. And then one day, his provincial rang up and he said, Jean-Jacques, I want you to come back to France and to teach economics at the University of Lyon. He was completely thrown, demolished, depressed, and then he remembered the joy of giving away his life, not knowing what would happen. And being a good Frenchman, he went out and he bought a bottle of champagne <laughs> and he drank to the freedom of the kingdom. Three or four years later, he was teaching economics in Lyon and I gave him a ring. I'd just been elected master of the order and I desperately needed some people on the council who I knew and could work with. And I tracked him down. I said, Jean-Jacques, could you, could you come and uh, be part of the team in Rome? And he said, could I think about it? And I said, sure. He said, for a month. And I said, well, what about making it for a day? <laughs> and so he came. More champagne. Obedience is the liberty of not knowing what happens next. We look at some more of the implications of that this afternoon. It's obedience, not just to our brothers and sisters, it's obedience to the people of God and their unknown and unpredictable needs. We do not know what the people will ask of us. I often think in this context of another French Dominican called Jean, a friend of mine. He'd been a worker priest in Paris for 20 years. And then he felt, it's a complicated story, called to go to India. So he came to Oxford when I was a student to learn Bengali. And I remember saying to him, Jean, what are you going to do when you go to Calcutta? What's your plan? And he said, how do you mean my plan? He said, it's not for me to have the plan. I go to hear what they will ask me to do. Obedience means not knowing beforehand. Of course, it's not only religious who practice this form of obedience. Barbara Brown Taylor tells of a Methodist minister in Kansas who was 
extremely popular, loved in his congregation, a great success. But the moment came when he had to stand up against the racial segregation in his parishes. He stood by the door to make sure that anybody could enter. They crucified him. His congregation nailed an effigy of him and nailed it on the door and drove him out of town. And Barbara Brown Taylor wrote, wrote, that was when I began to understand that God's call was not only wonderful but also terrible. It has sharp edges to it. It was capable of cutting deep. And those who reached out to grasp it had better be prepared to bleed. No wonder Peter resists. So what's distinctive about, about our vocation is not that we're obedient to the Lord. Every Christian disciple is called to this. It's a sort of public expression of how all human beings are summoned to what is beyond our imagination. You might say we are the strip artists of obedience. Everybody takes off their clothes at night privately. We do so in public, exposing and embracing the unpredictability of God's summons. We have no career structure. Our future is unknowable, not because our superiors are unpredictable, <laughs> but because the Lord summons us to what the heart cannot conceive. And this is true not only of obedience, but of poverty and chastity too. I'll just say a word about chastity because that's, I suppose, less obvious. Herbert McCabe said, Chastity, which is not a manifestation of love, is merely the corpse of true chastity. Married life speaks of God's love in one way. It does this through one particular plot, the ideal story of mutual commitment and shared life, shared future. The hope is that the married couple will live the rest of their lives together. That speaks of the mystery of God's love. But ours does too, in a different way. It speaks of God's love as the adventure into the unknown. Take the vow of chastity is to say that you don't know who you're going to have to love and who will be called to love you. We think we are assigned to a beautiful community, lovely brothers or sisters. It's all so wonderful. And then we have to leave them behind. When I went to Rome in 1992, my biggest worry wasn't administration of a big order. I didn't worry about the fact that I wasn't particularly competent. <laughs> what I worried about when I packed my bags, to put it absolutely briefly and honestly, was would I find anybody who would love me there and whom I could love too? I was setting off for this great big Dominican curia it was filled with all sorts of important people with grand titles, procurator general, postulator general, searches for the apostolic life, treasurer of the order, all these great titles. I didn't know who they were. I didn't even know what they would do. <laughs> I was only worried about one thing, is would I be lonely? Would I actually find in these unknown people, people who would love me and who I could love in return? I did, in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. But you can't be quite sure. You might be locked up in a cell by your brethren, like St. John of the Cross. Well, those Carmelites, you know. <laughs> but somehow you trust that God will provide on the journey, as he did for Elijah trekking through the wilderness to the mountain. It's because religious life speaks of our hope for an unknown future, the kingdom, 
that I believe it will always necessarily involve some people who make vows until death. It's a sign of the God who goes on calling us time and time again until we are fully alive in the kingdom. So the gift of a whole life, a whole future, is, I think, an intrinsic part of that sign. It, it embraces all from now onwards, Jesus says, not for a bit, from now onwards. And that embraces our death. I think facing death is a very important part of religious life. The death of our institutions. How can we be those who preach the death and resurrection of Christ? How can we be those who talk about death and resurrection if we're afraid of our own communities and congregations dying? What possible authority could we have? Often, you know, I have to say that, that some of my brethren and sisters had given me most in how they die. I remember a rather eccentric Dominican in Oxford called Gervais Matthew, a famous figure in England. You won't have heard of him over here. I got a phone call one from, from him one day, and he said, Timothy, he said, come to see me in hospital today. So I did. I left London, came to, came to Oxford, and there he was, and he said, Now, Timothy, I'm going to die tomorrow morning, he said. I want you to go out and buy two tins of beer so that we can drink to the kingdom of God. Anyway, a nurse came by as we were... I went out of the ward weeping, very emotional. The English are very emotional, you know. bought the beer, came back, and we were drinking it, and this nurse came by, and she said, Father Gervais, she said, you know you're not allowed any alcohol with your pills. <laughs> and he said, don't be a silly old thing. I'm going to die tomorrow morning. <laughs> so I said to him, well, Gervais, I'm just going to cancel the lecture I'm due to give this evening in London. He said, I've never stopped any of the brethren teaching. He said, you go and give the lecture. I'll hang on till you get back which he did. A well-known and excellent spiritual writer called John O'Donohue wrote that the best decision he ever made was to be a priest. And the second best decision he ever made was to leave the priesthood. He may be right, but I think that in that case one must either say that he never had a vocation to be a priest, or else that he gave it up. Maybe his real vocation was to be a spiritual writer. And his being a priest was actually never his vocation. It was just a stage in his discovering of what his vocation is. A vocation for every human being embraces all that you are, usque ad mortem. Every Christian has a vocation to be a disciple, and that might involve sharing our lives for some time, collaborating in our ministry. I think uh, the associates are a wonderful and growing part of our religious life. So what I'm saying is in no way, in no sense, a rejection or criticism of that. But I'm trying to say that to be a professed religious, I think always necessarily embraces a life and a death. A last couple of words. For this path, we need two things. We need courage and we need joy. Jesus says to Peter, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. We need the courage to set out into the deep. As the Pope wrote in Novo Millennio Inuente, duc in altum, go out into the deep. And we have to form each other as courageous men and women. 
for this journey into the unknown. And this is especially necessary at this stage in the life of the church. Because in our beloved church at the moment, we are frequently lacking in courage. People seem to be afraid of every little shadow in the dark. We need courage, which doesn't mean to say that we're not afraid, but that we're not ruled by fear. Peter was often afraid. He's even terrified of Paul, I think. But he hangs in to the end. So how are you going to form the candidates that come, are given to you by God, as brave, unafraid of anything? And we walk with joy. Our lives will only point to the fulfillment of every human vocation if they are already marked by joy. I was drawn to religious life because I saw the joy of some religious. I feel, think particularly of uh, a Benedictine great uncle of mine. Already we have the joy of arrival. Eternity starts now, but that's another lecture. They are happy whose strength is in you, whose hearts are on the roads to Zion. So we have to be signs of the courage and joy of those who don't know what lies around the corner. We promise to go on letting God surprise us. And in the next lecture, I will look at vocation as a way of belonging. Thank you very much. Thank you, Timothy. You'll notice on your schedule, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll notice on your schedule that we go to break now. Those of you who would like to come back early from your break for the quiet reflection, please feel free to do that. Again, this morning the break is in the exhibit room. Feel free to do that too. And at 11.30 we will reconvene at our tables for the table conversations. See you at 11.30. Thank you. Would it, just before calling Timothy back up here to the microphone, would remind you once again just to look at the mic protocol and to be attentive to that when you get up to the mic. We do encourage you. We're, we're hoping for a lot of participation. And so with that, Timothy, please come. On now? Good. Perfect. Um, you certainly gave us a lot to think about, Timothy. Appreciate that. Um, one of the things I was wondering about, and those at our table as well, you talked about how in religious life we lost a sense of secular vocation, and so much was channeled in the pastoral ministry, and that's made it difficult for people to image religious life for them. Could you talk a little bit more about that? I, I'm not sure. Let's think now. Um, Clearly, I, I'm not saying that the only valid way to be a religious is to have a secular vocation. I say that's more a question of the imagination. That I think a society, you hear me all? Yes. Yes. I can never really believe anybody can hear me until I can hear my own voice bouncing.
I, so I wasn't actually wanting to privilege um, religious having a secular vocation more than doing pastoral ministry, not at all. I, I was just really raising that almost as a question of imagination. That it's easier to imagine what might be uh, a religious vocation if you live in a society where you've already got the idea of a secular vocation. But actually, I think in our society now, very often, it's, it's just as valid uh, to practice your vocation as religious in, in any number of ways. Uh, and that, in fact, in a society where people often that security of the, of, the, of the clear track, the clear vocation, in this sort of society, there is a lot to be said for the fact but many of us don't have secular vocations. So I certainly wasn't in any way trying to, to say uh, that it's a good thing that people have left that to do parochial work or a bad thing, just how it might touch our instinctive understanding of, uh, of the nature of vocation as such. Steve Powick, uh, Region 5, Glenmary Home Missioner. Um, this question came out in various ways at our table. I'm going to express it from my community, however. I represent Glenmary, founded in 1939. The energy of our men came from the Second Vatican II. They were in the forefront of civil rights. They were in the forefront. So I have of uh, ecumenicalism and all these different changes. And some of the people in our community have lost courage and hope because of the disappointment in the direction they think the church might be headed. Could you address some of that disillusionment of that generation? I'm of a different generation. But there's really, and for me, I mourn for them. There seems to be real grief in them. So if you could address that. Sure. Maybe not very well, but just a little word. I joined the order in 1965, um, uh, before some of you were born. And uh, I made, I got clothed as a novice uh, about the day the Second Vatican Council ended. Uh, and there was an enormous sense of optimism in the church, of excitement. We were going to change the church, we were going to change the world, we were going to bring in the kingdom. But it was also a time of tremendous optimism uh, within the whole of society. I was in Paris in the years after 68. I did my turn behind the barricades. Um, it was, as they used to say, l'imagination au pouvoir, imagination to, the, to power. And so we shared, we shared in the exuberance of the time. And to some extent, we were carried by the optimism of that era. Now, we live in a time where that, that hopefulness has been lost by the hope, whole of society. And that means that if we can find ways of living our hope, it will speak very powerfully. You see, it was great to be hopeful in an optimistic society. <laughs> now, to be bearers of hope in a society that has lost hope, is a far more powerful witness. Which is why I think, in a way, this is a terribly important moment for religious life and for Christianity. Of course, Christianity is more integral to public life in the United States than it is almost anywhere else in the world. But certainly in good old secularist Western Europe, uh, where there is very little sense of hope for the future, I think we have something to give we didn't have so powerfully to give 30, 40 years ago. So what I would say is we have to, we have, to have the excitement of measuring up to the challenge. Uh, I think at this moment, I mentioned already living after 9-11, I think we are living at one of the alas, great turning points possibly in the history of humanity. <coughs> 
uh, there are tremendous and enormous challenges. And if we can discover in this difficult moment that we have something to offer, then it may be of significance. So we may feel ourselves marginalized, maybe a bit marginalized inside the church, maybe marginalized inside society. I mean, uh, uh, you know, the church has lost so much of its reputation. But it is a moment where we may do things of an importance which it is very hard to exaggerate. Uh, and I think particularly in America, in the United States, where you live, in the only superpower in this world, uh, then as religious you have an enormous possibilities and responsibility to see how you can, can be signs of hope when so many people are resigning themselves to just a future of violence. Well, I thought there was somebody making their way to the microphone. <laughs> uh, Karen Murphy, Toronto. Uh, Timothy, I'd just like you to maybe see if there's a connection in your mind between the idea that you put forward with regards to obedience as that, that ability or willingness to be surprised and some of the, for me, what I see as the growing or increasing trend prevalence of the, the discernment process in religious life, in institutional religious life, for um, ministerial choices and ministerial um, appointments, if you like. The, the, um, the old way of, you know, you, you were informed, uh, now it's much more of a dialogue and um, I just was curious as to how your idea of the, the surprise element was there. <laughs> that's that's a, an interesting and a, and a complex question. <laughs> I, th I think uh, each religious family, of course, has its own tradition of how, just to take the example of obedience, how that works. In my own tradition, the Dominican tradition, the idea of a blind obedience uh, has... Microphone's gone. <laughs> In my own tradition, the Dominican tradition, uh, being surprised doesn't mean that you get uh, a letter under the under the door <laughs> saying, Timothy, you are off to Cambridge tomorrow. It, it's true, we did have a provincial in Ireland who was a, Father Coffey, Father David Coffey, who was always known as Instant Coffey. <laughs> <laughs> so he was capable of several often contradictory assignations in the same morning. <laughs> when I say surprise, I, I don't mean to imply somehow passivity, that you just sort of sit there and get sent anywhere as a puppet. Certainly in our tradition, obedience, which as you know is rooted in the word ob audience, to hear, implies, if you want discussion, it implies intelligence. Uh, you couldn't have a stupid obedience. That would be a failure of obedience. Because real obedience implies a mutual listening, a mutual discerning of what is good for the gospel. So I think it's not the surprise of those uh, who just have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. 
It's more, if you want, the surprise of what the gospel may demand. And discovering what the gospel may demand will imply reflection. Again, I mean, I think it's probably true for most of you, but it's certainly in my tradition, your primary obedience is to the community. The primary obedience you have is to the chapter. And it's the chapter thinks, they talk, they discuss, they reflect. They use their intelligence with a bit of luck sometimes. <laughs> uh, and so you're responding, if you want, to what is the fruit, the fruit of discernment. So I'm not trying to call us back to a discredited past model. Uh, but I think the surprise is equally great. Does that, does that respond really to the sort of things you were trying to indicate? Good. It's only the men who are lining up to speak. Oh, thanks be to God. <laughs> Thank you for women. No. God gifted me with many things, but height was not one of them. <laughs> Try here. Um, I am Sister Regina Gallo. I am a Sister of Providence of St. Mary of the Woods, Indiana. And I think I'm going to speak on behalf of the minority. Um, I am 32 years old. I just professed my first vows July, this past July 11th. And I have more of just, I think, a comment than a question. Um, but I think it's just about the whole idea of hope. And you know, being young and new and entering into a life form that is not the norm of today's day and age, um, I get a lot of questions about that. And what I am saying yes to, I have no idea where that is going to lead me. The only thing that I can do is trust that and myself with my community and those of us that are saying yes, whether it's one, whether it's 10, to take that journey together, because if we don't hope, we will die. Um, and I can't lose that hope. And I can identify with Peter a lot, thinking I'm going to sink and drown. Um, but Peter hung in there. And I pray to God that I hang in there and that I trust when the hope seems to be just diminishing. And we can take that journey together, and we can go where we don't know we're going to go, and to go together with hope, with love, and being the hope for a world that doesn't maybe know how to define that. And I don't know how we do it. The only thing that I think we can do is trust it. And with that, I don't know, so. Could I, could I not respond, because it wasn't a question, but I mean, as it were, link myself into what you've said, which moves me a great deal. Uh, and I think uh, even the name, being a sister of Providence, <laughs> is actually a very, it's a very beautiful title to have, isn't it? Um, and you're not a daughter of Providence, you're a sister of Providence. I'm a daughter of Mother Peter. Sorry? I'm a daughter of Mother Peter. <laughs> and, and that trust in the Providence, uh, and Providence means to see beforehand, pro videre, and it's unfortunately God who sees in advance, it's not us who see in advance. I think, or, or, I, I, my, I've just got two little reactions, if I, if I may share them. The first is to, is to trust that it will be fruitful, but you mightn't know how, and you might never know how. It might be fruitful that people, young people of, of your generation, and eventually younger, will see you and think, yes. Um, this is something for us too. I, that's beginning to happen in a lot of places around the world. In Belgium, for example, we had one brave young guy, and it seemed crazy. There were hardly anybody under the age of 60. Now there are 
that might be the fruitfulness. But you, you may have a fruitfulness that you don't know. But you can trust that it's there. The other thing is to say to the people who take decisions in all our congregations, if, if, you, give, if you receive the gift of young people, is don't use them to carry on doing what we've been doing before. We don't want young people to do what we did. We want young people to do what we couldn't do or never thought of doing or which didn't have to be done then. And so uh, what we have to do is to get out of saying, oh, well, it's wonderful. Here we got this nice young person and he or she can help our old die. Part of the generosity I, I think of those of us, and I am increasingly aware of it as the years go by, uh, is that when my time comes to become incapable, is the last thing I must want is to, for young friars to look after. They've joined to do They've joined to preach the gospel. Let them get on with it. <laughs> I think that the providence that you Uh, the providence that you trust for your future, those of us who are older must trust for ours, too. That we will be looked after, and that we won't try to use the young to solve our problems. So all my prayers. Thank you. I'm uh, Len Altilia, a Jesuit from Canada. I want to talk about hope as well because um, I think the failure of hope is simply in the fact that our hope is too small. Um, I learned a lesson from my father. Uh, in 1973, he learned from his doctor that he was dying of cancer. And my mother called me, I happened to be in the city, at the, in the same city at the time, and said, you better come talk to your father. Uh, I was nine years into my Jesuit life at that time. And when I walked in the door, I, my father was in quite a high state of anger and frustration, and I asked him what the problem was, and he was very angry at the doctor. And when I asked him why, he said, because he took away all my hope. And this was the first time that I had a chance to minister to my family. It was also the first time I ever spoke back to my father. <laughs> and I said, what the hell were you hoping for? You taught me to believe in the resurrection, and now you tell me you don't believe it. So why am I a Jesuit? The resurrection is what we hope for, nothing less. And if our hope is in anything less than the resurrection, it's too small. And our life is about the resurrection. Our life is about life with God, beyond this one. And our vows are about the resurrection. It's a proclamation of hope in the resurrection, where God will be everything for us. And we say God is everything for us now. We're not going to wait for the resurrection. So in saying that we, are, we, we live in a time where hope is essential, we have to be sure that our hope is big enough and, and strong enough to proclaim the truth of the promise of the resurrection. So that it isn't so much a matter of saying that my life is a, is a, it points to the kingdom uh, and it's a story about which I don't really see the end. We do actually see the end we have a, a, an opportunity to proclaim the end of the story is in fact life with God. And we need to call young people to that level of faith, which to me is the biggest crisis, is in our secularization and in our, in our materialism, we have lost that sense of faith that God is with us and that God is big enough and important enough to stake our life on. The hope has to be bigger, I think. I wouldn't want to contradict that at all. I mean, I think that's absolutely right. I don't think it contradicts what I'm saying at all. Um, I'm not sure whether it's in a talk I'm giving in the next few days, but I'm not sure whether it's this afternoon or somewhere else. 
Well, I try to say, I'll say it briefly in case it's this afternoon. <laughs> it, which is precisely, of course, that eternity is not what happens afterwards. Eternity is what happens now. And eternity is what happens now if, in fact, you break through from hatred into love. That's the eternity starting. Meister Eckhart said, what is today? He said, today is forever. And, uh, or, or I could take another example of the, the Deer Park Monastery run by that Buddhist monk whose name I can never quite pronounce. At the door, a sign which says, if the kingdom of God does not start now, it starts never. So, in that sense, I completely agree. I don't think that contradicts expands what I'm <laughs> Oh, a battery. <laughs> I, think, I think that's where the joy comes. That's, that's why I wanted to finish on the note of joy. Because I think the joy is, if you want, the eternal happiness breaking in now. Uh, but I better change my batteries, otherwise. <laughs> I'm Vicki Vandenberg. I'm mission helper from Baltimore. And I just want to thank you for your very energizing um, talk. I think the whole conference has been, I don't know, just full of energy. Um, and I attended a conference last month where, um, you know, I think the, the theme was looking at the now, but I didn't feel that kind of um, projection into the future. And so it might have been where I was, but I, I walked away feeling uh, very heavy. And, um, you know, and, and I was trying to figure out during this conference what exactly, you know, that was about. Um, and I think that one of the things that you said that I find a challenge is that, I don't want to um, say it differently than you said, but that facing death is an important reality of religious life and not to fear that because how, how we preach death and resurrection that, um, you know, we can't be afraid of that. But, and I, I guess that's the difference for me, that the resurrection is the future. Um, and uh, um, I think this conference, and it's probably because of, you know, who gathers at these conferences, but we are about the future. And I just find great hope in that. And, and I think I find that challenging also being part of leadership to, to um, you know, have people say, um, you know, to me, you know, gosh, why did they waste, you know, electing you now because, you know, we could have saved you for a later time. And I think, oh, man, how depressing, <laughs> you know? It's like, gosh, I mean, uh, you know, I may not be, you know, 33 anymore, but I consider myself still young. And um, I, I just find that uh, this... This group, this body, I'm going to walk. Around, I'm going to walk away, and I'm going to have that energy to give back to not only our leadership but to the rest of the congregation. And it is about not just the death, but resurrection. So, thank you. I just asked if I'd like to make one small comment to, to bring it to an end, but I think we're. We're really carrying on, so to be premature to say any words in conclusion now. So we'll, we'll carry on this afternoon. Uh, I'm just going to gra grab a quick sandwich and prepare for this afternoon while you <laughs> all stuff yourselves for the lunch. <laughs>